even though all the money that we're pouring into these institutions <laughs> is looking good. But I think the, uh, the performance has been, has been great, and um, we're really excited to be here, particularly for this bill signing and then the award presentation of the Medal of Freedom and then the recognition. We're really honored to be joined uh, by Ben Ferenz, the last living prosecutor from the Nuremberg trials. And he will get the Governor's Medal of Freedom, and the bill I'll sign into law will codify the Governor's Medal of Freedom into our statutes. What the legislature had been doing is putting uh, m money in the budget, but, but a, a provision in the budget, which lasts every year. This will be permanent, and we're really excited. The first recipient of the Governor's Medal of Freedom was Coach Bobby Bowden from Florida State, and we were able to do that prior to him passing away uh, last year. Uh, we also have our second recipient, Felix Rodriguez, is here. Uh, great American patriot, Cuban exile, fought the good fight in the military and in the CIA, and he's one of the, uh, uh, the foremost legends in the history of the Central Intelligence Agency. And then our third award was uh, Barbara Nicholas, who's done so much for helping all our kids in pediatric health care. Uh, she wanted to be here today, but her and Jack are at a place called Augusta National for the Masters. What are you going to do? But we're really excited. We're also excited to recognize two Holocaust survivors, I think the oldest Holocaust survivors we have in the state of Florida. Uh, we have Samuel Ron and Norman Frajman, and they're both here in the south. One's in uh, Boca, one is in, uh, in uh, Boynton Beach, and we wanna, we're going to give them recognitions as well. I would also like to thank Barbara Feingold, as well as Palm Beach County Commissioner Maria Sachs, for nominating Mr. Friends for the Governor's Medal of Freedom. And Barbara and her late husband Jeffrey have been longtime supporters of FIU. And the thing I, I think that FAU should be proud of is they've been very, very strong on things like Holocaust education, and they've been very strong against campus anti-Semitism. And if you look at a lot of American universities, unfortunately, anti-Semitism is kind of something that is cheek in certain circles. Uh, FAU has not gone down that road, and I'm also very proud uh, that in keeping with what FAU's done, the state of Florida is right there with, with them in terms of battling anti-Semitism. My first year as governor, we did a historic trade mission to Israel, and we did a bunch of stuff. I know FAU has, has relationships with, with some of the universities from Israel because of that trip. We have business relationships, a lot of other stuff. But one of the things we did that they did there is we did a meeting of the Florida cabinet at the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, which was historic. And I signed into law HB 741, which is Florida's anti-Semitism bill. Some people criticize us, said it's too strong. All we said was, we are going to treat anti-Semitism exactly the same as we treat racism, and that is zero tolerance for any of our institutions in the state of Florida. Uh, over the last three-plus years, we've al allocated millions of dollars for the Florida Holocaust Museum, the Miami Beach Holocaust Memorial, the Holocaust Task Force, the Holocaust Victims Assistance Administration, the Holocaust Documentation and Education Center, and the Boca Raton Jewish Federation's Holocaust Survivors Assistance Program. And I can tell you when the, the vaccines first became available, Florida was the first state to say we're going to give to elderly first. And what we did was, you know, you had different sites you could go to. You had it in different pharmacies and all that. But we had a lot of very elderly people that they did home visits to. And we did it from some of our Bay of Pigs veterans that Felix knows from the Cuban-American community in Miami. But we did Holocaust survivors, where you would actually go and help. And it was, you got it. But we relied on these groups here in South Florida to be able to identify and basically said, hey, do you want, do you want a vaccine? We don't believe in mandates, so we didn't make them, but, it, but do you want it? If you want it, we were able to make home visits. And they made thousands and thousands of home visits for World War II vets, Holocaust survivors, uh, as well as folks who were veterans of the Bay of Pigs. So we're excited. We're, we're happy about that. We have also led the way in Florida on strong Holocaust education standards. That is a requirement in Florida schools that that is there. Uh, we have strong standards uh, that were implemented last year. The Department of Education is putting together a very robust Holocaust curriculum that schools will be able uh, to do. And 
the curriculum is really focusing on a lot of the primary source material. You know, Ben was involved in uncovering um, a lot of this stuff. You have people out there that deny the Holocaust. Why don't you look at the evidence? Why don't you look at all of this and make sure that everybody knows the truth? And so we're really proud that we're doing that. And uh, I think we've done uh, a lot already, but I think when the new curriculum comes out, it'll even be better. Uh, and also, since I've been governor, we have allocated $13 million for security at our Jewish day schools. And we're uh, proud to be able to do that. So I have two letters of gratitude uh, for, our, uh, for our two Holocaust survivors, uh, Sam and Norman. Uh, Samuel grew up near Krakow, Poland, and during the Holocaust, he spent several months in the forced labor camp featured in the movie Schindler's List. Two of Samuel's uncles, an aunt and a cousin, were saved from extermination because they were on Schindler's List and worked in his factories during the war. He was liberated from a Nazi death march by the U.S. Army in 1945. In the years after the war, he made it to the United States and worked to help other Holocaust survivors who were stuck behind the Iron Curtain escape Soviet oppression, including 600 children who he helped bring to Israel. Samuel is now, are you 97? 97 years old, living in Boca Raton. So thank you so much. Norman Frajman was born in Warsaw, Poland, and witnessed the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. His mother, himself, and his sister were then taken to a Nazi concentration camp where his mother and sister were murdered. He survived forced labor camps where he made weaponry for the Germans and was liberated from a Nazi death march by the Soviet Army in 1945. He is now 92. 92 years old, living in Boynton Beach. He was one of the beneficiaries of our vaccination program for seniors, uh, but we want to thank him uh, and offer our appreciation for, for his wonderful heroism and life of service as well. letters of recognition uh, for our, our two Holocaust survivors. So I want to turn that back to the left. Uh, and this one is for Ben and Norman. So I'm now going to do two things. First, I'm going to sign the legislation to make this award part of our, our permanent statues. As I mentioned, it's, it's really the highest award the state uh, can give, and it's to recognize people that have had ex exemplary lives and have exemplary achievements. Clearly, our honoree today fits that bill. But the hope on this is, yes, we're here honoring Ben Ferenz, and he deserves it, and it's important to recognize people that have had these extraordinary lives. But I hope what it'll also do uh, is serve to further the legacy of people like Ben. I want kids in our school to be learning about him 10, 15, 20 years into the future. You know, we've been able to honor some great people, uh, but when you start talking about that World War II era, and you look, we're now in 2022, you know, a lot of the firsthand experience is fading. That's natural how life happens. And so I think it's really important that people like me and many of you here who weren't alive then, who only know from either the history books or talking to firsthand people, that we do our best to make sure that people understand 
uh, the evils of the Holocaust. They understand the heroism that we saw for people like we see on this stage. And so I'm going to be signing a bill in the law later this month that is going to include and require stories of inspiration in our K-12 through school system. I think somebody like Ben is going to be one of those stories of inspiration. And so when we're signing this here, we're going to continue to recognize great people in our state. Uh, we want to do that. They deserve it. Uh, but we also want to serve that uh, to, to be a, a marker for, for future legacy and for inspiration for people who are in the younger generation. And so we'll sign this, uh, and then we'll do the presentation uh, to Ben. I got to talk a little bit. You feel free to take a seat there. Um, but Ben, you know, I see him and I'm like, man, you look really good for being 72 years old. <laughs> Turns out he's 102. Can we all could be so lucky? Sharp. So he was born in 1920 in Transylvania and his family came to the United States 10 months later. He grew up in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of New York City. He was the first person in his family to go to college, and he eventually attended Harvard Law School. And I just want to know, for the record, he is getting this medal in spite of going to Harvard, not because of going to Harvard. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, he tried to enlist in the Air Corps, the Marine Corps, but as Ben recalls, they rebuffed him because of his stature, so he continued with his studies. But after graduating from Harvard Law, he ended up in the Army on his way to Europe, where he landed on the beaches of Normandy, crossed the Rhine on a pontoon bridge, and survived nearly every major, major battle of the war, including the final Battle of the Bulge. He was awarded five battle stars for his service. As Nazi concentration camps were discovered towards the end of the war, Ben was summoned to General Patton's headquarters, where he investigated these war crimes. When Ben would hear about a newly liberated concentration camp, he would jump into his army jeep, race to the camp, and take command of documenting and saving evidence from destruction, particularly preserving evidence of Nazi crimes and their paperwork and documentation. Not long after he was honorably discharged from the Army at the end of 1945, he was recruited for the Nuremberg War Crime Trials and became the chief prosecutor for the United States, and I'm not going to say this right, but the Eisengruppen Eisen Eisen case, using Nazi documents, like, Nazi documents like he helped to preserve at the concentration camps, they were able to convict 22 defendants charged with murdering over one million people. <laughs> he later worked uh, for, for several years as a private practicing attorney, but he then turned his attention to preserving the peace that he fought to bring about, and he's written more than a half a dozen books on his personal, personal vision for the future, and when you look at the Nuremberg trials and other things where bringing people to justice who 
may need to be doing that with what's going on in the world right now very soon. Um, this is one of the guys that, that made it happen. And, you know, when you get justice for something like what was done by Nazi Germany, I mean, you can never achieve, you know, the, the full because it was just so, so uh, terrible, the crimes. But he held people accountable, and I think if it wasn't for people like him, you know, you would not have the, the fortitude that I think we all shared never again to let this happen. And so I think this is a phenomenal award. He's um, a resident of Delray Beach, and uh, as the last surviving Nuremberg prosecutor, he's really a living legend. We're darn proud that he's a Florida resident, and it's my honor to, to place this sit and stand. Uh, I'm sure you can all hear me and you can all see me if you look carefully. Uh, my age is 103, not 102. I'm going to <laughs> I want to thank the uh, mayor, uh, the governors, uh, for the honor of, of uh, receiving your medals. And uh, mostly, I welcome the opportunity to share uh, what I have learned from the horrors that I have seen. And uh, the horrors are really indescribable. I was liberated in most of the American Army liberated camps, Buchenwald and uh, Mauthausen and a whole slew of camps, dead bodies all lying on the floor. Uh, their eyes may be pleading for help, some groveling in the garbage, looking for a slice of bread uh, before they were pushed into the crematorium to be burned. And uh, that sort of made a very rather lasting impression on me in that uh, after setting up the programs of compensation for the Nazi victims, which was very important for them, uh, and getting people organized to recognize the evils of what had taken place under the Nazi regime. Uh, my hope was that we could create a more humane and peaceful world where no one would be killed or persecuted because of his race or his religion or his political belief. And I made those arguments in my closing statements where I had the 22 defendants convicted uh, after two days of trial. It was my first case, hot out of the Harvard Law School. Uh, and uh, uh, 13 of them were sentenced to death. Four were actually executed, the others with various cl clemency actions. I tried to build on that to prevent it from happening again. Uh, my closing statement, I pointed to the defendants. I said, these men wrote the blackest page in human history. Death was their tool, life was their toy. If these men be immune, then law has lost its meaning and we must all live in fear. Those were my closing statements uh, in the biggest murder trial in human history and it was my first case. Uh, so we see it still happening today. Uh, people, you see the pictures on television, running with their infant children, hospitals being bombed, and we have not yet learned the lesson from Nuremberg, uh, despite the fact that we laid it out clear and unmistakable. What can we still do about it? Well. We can stop glorifying war making if we possibly can. I know it'll be very difficult. Wars have been glorified for centuries. And here comes this little guy from Pen Transylvania, not Pennsylvania. Uh, and he said, no, that's a horrible thing. The Constitution of the United Nations 
requires that all laws, wars be settled by peaceful means only. And then it's ignored. And uh, so it's up to the new generation. We don't have too many youngsters here in this audience, but take it home for your ch children and grandchildren. They live in great danger now. You also live in great danger, but you may not live to see it. Uh, we now have the capacity to cut off the electrical grid on planet Earth. The Russians can do the same. The Chinese can do the same. There may be others. When I was told that in secret some 10 years ago by an American general who was stationed in the Pentagon, I didn't know what the cyberspace was. He said, well, we can cut off the electrical grid on planet Earth. I said, cut off the electrical grid on the planet? How long would it take for everybody to die? He said, it, I'm not aware of any serious studies which have yet been made on that subject, but my guess is it would depend upon how much water they had. If they had water to drink, they could probably stay alive for about a week. A week? And then everybody's dead. My friends, that's the next war. That'll be the last war. This planet is vulnerable. If you don't stop this willingness to settle your despair by killing the guy you think is your adversary, your future, you'll never go to 102 years old. Uh, maybe you'll go a little bit longer. I don't know how soon that'll break. But we have got to learn to detest settling your disputes by killing a bunch of people that had nothing to do with it. And innocent people, these young students, they're eager to serve their country. I was with at Harvard when the Japanese attacked the United States in Pearl Harbor. Everybody I knew went down to enlist. Well, it was a patriotic action, and uh, that's the only tool we had. So the future is up to you. You are now all here, mature enough to understand what I'm saying. Unfortunately, to be able to see what is happening still in the world today, where a country says, we want to invade the other country. I was born in the same bed as my sister was born a year and a half before me. She was a Hungarian by birth. I was born in the same bed in the same house. I was a Romanian. Uh, they had changed after the First World War, and dividing up the countries. What did it tell me? And it didn't matter what they called the country. It's what they did for their citizens that counts. And the names don't count if you call it Ukraine or you call it Russia or whatever you call it. That shouldn't be the determinant to justify your going out and killing a bunch of people. It had nothing to do with anything. And that's the current practice. So I appreciate very much this recognition um, by medals and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, but uh, we've got to have a change of heart and mind. And uh, I keep working all the time. And I still work all the time. And uh, long hours. Because I'm trying to change the way people think about war. If they don't think about it, their heart will not change either. So you have to think about it and ask yourself, is this a way for human beings to behave? Animals don't behave that way. They eat their prey. That's why they kill them. I should have them re -eat, eat all your enemies if you kill anybody in wartime. So we live in a difficult time. Fortunately, there are things like our, your governor here and, and others uh, who are to be praised. To, to use the universities to pay, teach the people that I find the three words solutions to the problems to be simple law, not war. And then I have another three words that you have to remember. In addition to law, not war, remember never give up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all. Here's your proclamation. It's got that. Here's the, uh, here's the case for that. Congratulations, man. That was awesome. What a man. Great man right here.
ever have Putin held accountable, that you wheel him out as the prosecutor, it would be lights out. There'd be no, no worries at that point. Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for being here. I want to thank FAU, FAU for hosting us. Uh, uh, keep doing what you're doing. We do have some young people, and I want to, want to thank them for uh, taking the time to be involved and to honor uh, a really great American and a really great Floridian. And uh, this is uh, going to be an award that is going to continue to be given out in many, many years to come. And you know, we've got, uh, we've got a really big state. There's a lot of people, even when they do things other places, somehow most people find their way uh, to Florida. And so we're blessed that we have so many people that have done some, some truly remarkable things. But, but this, is, uh, this is really, really big. So, so, so God bless uh, all of you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for coming.